Hey, everybody. Oh, man, I got a guy on the channel today. I'm super excited. <laughs> He's on Strong Inspirations. He's a super cool guy. Uh, and uh, one of them PhD types, you know what I mean? And uh, he's going to tell you some history that is going to blow your mind because it's from the Latin America perspective. All right, I, I'm giving you a little clue on it because I'm coming at you from around the world with the people who come on the channel. I'm super excited. I'm telling you strong inspirations has made me a better person because of, of the people who come on the channel. My, my name, I, I forgot to tell you, is Anthony Brogdon, and uh, you my people, and there's nothing you can do about it. You sitting there watching me, and I can feel it, and I get messages from you every now and then, uh, and some people more often than others, are how you like what I'm doing. But this has become my calling, my friends. So hit the subscribe button on Strong Inspirations. It, we, we don't ask no information. It's free. Uh, it just let me know you like me. And then hit the like button on this video. You're going to love what this guy got to tell you. I, I promise you, this going to be fun, everybody. And then hit the notifications bell for when the videos come up, you get a ding, a shock, a smoke signal. The, the lights flicker in your house. Uh uh, your dog gives you a nudge, something to let you know that there's new content. Because I'm trying to give you at least one or two or three every week. It's that much history in the world. And we are international. Did you see the one I did with the guy out of Lagos, Nigeria, who said that his family and the people he in his community were so poor, they had to fight naked because they couldn't tear up the clothes. Whoa. And then my man <laughs> went on. His dad talked to him and told him the importance of education. He went to college. Got and it. now he has his own TV show in uh in um South Africa, I believe it is. Watch that wow. video. Did you see the one That's I did him. with the guy out of Mexico? The, he's well, he's not out of Mexico, but he's Mexican. He's a professor at a university. He says the the one of the most noted presidents in Mexico is an African-American guy. Watch mm -hmm. that video. Did you see the one where I did what the lady talks about how slavery got to the Latin America part of the world and the Brazils and, 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 and South Americas? Watch that video. I, I, I'm not playing with you, my friends. I, I, I'm, I'm going to give it to you straight, no chaser. I'm going to end it. Tox, not me, my guest, will intoxicate your mind. Not so you DUI, but so that you stagger with what they tell you. And watch this guy. He's going to tell you something. You say, ooh, I never knew that. And, and, and so tell people about Strong Inspirations. A couple more things. Uh, I'm this serious. I did this documentary called Business in the Black. It's streaming on Amazon. It's about the rise of black business in America. Uh, watch this. It's very good. Um, I, I was so enthralled and, and uh, upon the urging of people who saw it that I wrote this book. It's called Black Business Book, similar to the movie, but more facts. And this is on Amazon, but it's on my website also. Oh, I got one more thing. Look at this. I got a children's book now. It's titled They Did It. And this is about 30 <laughs> black business owners in the 1800s. I'm telling you, I'm not playing with you people. And and, and one more thing, and I, I, I this is going to, I got to let you know I'm traveling now. And I just got back from Selma, Alabama. I went to the, the, the 59th anniversary of the Bloody Monday, Bloody Sunday mm -hmm. in, in Selma, Alabama. And, and, and I'm going other places. And I'm speaking too. So uh, I, I, I talk about good black history. Now, you hear me use this term strong a lot. Strong is my favorite word. Uh, I, I like what strong stands for in my world, and that is strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that's the introduction to my guest today. He's a strong man out of the Latin American country. He's going to tell you about it. You're going to hear this firsthand. Watch it. He's, he's a scholar. He lived it. So come on, 
Thank you for being on Strong Inspirations. Let us know. Let's do it. It's an honor, man. It's an honor. Thank you for having me here. You know, I'll tell you a little bit about me, uh, Anthony. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico. No, no, hold on. Stop 1950s. there. Tell us your name. Tell us your name. Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Jorge Chinea. It's spelled C-H-I-N-E-A. I got that name from the Canary Islands on the west coast of Africa. My ancestors came to Puerto Rico from that island in 1815. And that term spread to the island because he had children who had children and so on and so forth. When I got older in Puerto Rico, people were saying, what does Chinea mean? It's not like Perez, Rodriguez, and Garcia. It's a very unusual name. Mm. So I started digging it up and I started doing some research and I learned that the people in the Canary Islands actually came from the continent of Africa on the northern part, from places like Morocco. And they were Berbers. So that means that they were part of the Arab family. And they migrated at some point due to, you know, probably internal uh, strife or some other reasons in Northern, uh, Af Northern uh, Africa, so, you know, um, above the Sahara. And then they migrated to those islands in the Atlantic called the Canary Islands. And okay. so uh, it, it is in one of those islands where my ancestors uh, uh, live. And, and they were considered there to be native peoples. So they belong to the early Guanches, a pre-Hispanic population that lived there. And, and so the name goes back to that time. I'm very proud of the fact that I belong to a, a family that potentially had this indigenous background uh, before they even came to the new world. All right, let, let, let me go over a little bit of that. Oh, okay, so they came out of Africa. Out of um, the Morocco, Northern Africa region. Okay. Uh, were they ever uh, conquered by a European nation or ever enslaved? Not at that, that point. Kind of Not at that point. The uh, Portuguese would go to the Canary Islands. Uh, the Italians went to the Canary Islands. And then the Spanish and the French went to the Canary Islands. And all of those cultures uh, left their imprint on, on the population which became more or less extinguished, except that there were seven or eight families that survived. Chineas are one of those families that survived. I don't know the circumstances or how they managed to pull that off, but somehow they were able to retain their last name. Okay, when you say extinguished, what do you mean by that? I'm sorry, that they were uh, retained? How no, they you were said extinguished. they were extinguished, and they were the, one of the few families left. What does that mean? Yeah, they were... It's uh, the archaeologists and local historians in the in the Canary Islands. They have looked at the uh, seven names that are typical of the area. They started going deep to see where they came from. And it turned out that they didn't come from Europe. They came from the Canary Islands original people, which are the ancestors or the descendants, I should say, of ancestors who came from uh, Africa prior to that. Okay. Now, now you say there was no enslavement, though, right? Well, in that area, this is the Canary Islands. We're still not in the Americas yet. So this is in the North Atlantic across from Africa. And um, at that particular at time, when they were there, there was no slavery. When the Europeans came there, they started importing enslaved Africans. And they also enslaved the local indigenous population. So my ancestors were sold off along with many other people that were indigenous to that to those islands. But somehow they survived and they were able to keep their last name. Oh, okay. Uh, um, uh, what, what is it, Hispanic? What does that mean? Well, Hispanic is a little different because uh, I was born in Puerto Rico right in the 1950s. By that time, Puerto Rico had been on the Spain for probably 500 years before 1898, which is when the United States took over uh, Puerto Rico. But between 1492, right, the arrival of Columbus to about eight, 1898, Puerto Rico was part of Spain. And because of that, uh, we spoke Spanish on the island and the culture was supposed to have been Hispanic. And so we were Hispanics because the island was Hispanicized.
by the Spaniards, but the people that lived in Puerto Rico before that were native people, Indians. Mm. Uh, okay, let's stay in this. Uh, I, 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 I keep it real on the show. I, are you considered black? In Puerto what? Rico, no. Uh, in the United States, people would say that we are brown people. Right. Because we come from the island, but here's the catch. In Puerto Rico, you can hardly find anyone on the island who does not have a black ancestor. We used right. to have a saying in Puerto Rico um, uh, that goes like this, and your mother and your grandmother, who was she? And that's a way of expressing to someone that if you think that you don't have black culture in you, think twice, because somewhere in your background, there will be a great grandmother a great great grandmother who was black. Okay, when when you say she was black, that means that she actually came from Africa. What is what does yes. black mean? Yes, yes. In, in Puerto Rico had the indigenous culture that was Indian, right? Like okay. the Native Americans. Okay, they were known as Taínos. So Puerto Ricans still today consider many of themselves as descendants of Taínos, the original Indians for Puerto Rico, but when the Spanish colonized that, that island, as they had done in the Canary Islands before that, they imposed their culture on the Tainos and the Tainos eventually became Hispanicized. They became Hispanic, but they retained, you know, elements of their culture in their music, their religion, their food, their dances, even the way they build their homes and the places in which they sleep. So there's a lot of things in Puerto Rico that are of Taino heritage. Of course, the Europeans also brought Africans. So when we look at Puerto Rican culture, a good part of it is Taino, the other part of it is African, and then the last part is European. So we had three three cultures in one. Is is there a mixing of Africans and Hispanics? Yes, a and, lot. And, and that's how a you lot. get the black? A lot, yes, because in Puerto Rico, the Europeans were too few. They came to Puerto Rico. They didn't find a lot of gold, a lot of silver. There was not a lot of wealth. So a lot of them stayed in Puerto Rico long enough to catch a ship to take them over to Mexico or to uh, South America where the real money was at. And consequently, the enslaved Africans that they imported continue to expand so that now you have a free black population and that population mixed in with whatever Europeans were left on the island and with some of the Tainos that were still around, I even though you. there was not that many by that point. Oh, I got you. So now uh, they, they took them to uh, Puerto Rico to, to harvest or just to be uh, indentured servants or... Yeah, to, yeah. Okay. Well, there's two... There's two pieces to that. Uh, Spain used to be part of the uh, war of Islam at one point. Okay. Spain was under Islamic rule for about eight centuries. So there was a Northern African uh, black culture in Spain before Columbus came to the new world. So many of the Spaniards who came to the new world, some of them were black already. And then they imported Africans to do labor. So you got the free blacks that were already in Spain, plus a large number of enslaved Africans that were transported against their will and brought over to work in a lot of different areas, mainly mining, and then later sugarcane. Uh, is there a, a, a class system there? You know, very you know much so. Always is something. Very uh, much so. Okay, go ahead. That was part of the uh, imperial domination of Spain, right? When you control a people, you want to divide and conquer. And so, what they did, they created an artificial system of caste, so that it, it it went from the darkest to the lightest. And if you were in the spectrum that was in the darker area, then you had less possibilities of doing well economically and socially, if you were on the spectrum side that was lighter, you, you did better. So they did this for on purpose because the idea was to divide and conquer. Sure. So you create 
social classes and you create ethnic groups as a way to keep everybody from getting together and unified. What were the groups called? What were the darker class called? Well, the the, uh, the Africans obviously is Negro. That was the category that they used. Although sometimes they use African. And then uh, the people that were mixed with European were called mulatos. And okay. then the people that the people that were mixed with native people like Indians were called mestizo or mixed. And then the people that were black and Indian, they had an, a different label to them. Or if you were black and something else. So there was a lot of mixtures along the way. And they categorized that into about 35 different categories. Really? Oh, man. 35. And, and, and but but did, did the Spanish continue to rule? They did from 1492 when they arrived in the Caribbean up until 1898 in the case of Puerto Rico and Cuba. And then they fought for the independence or what happened? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Native people fought a 10-year war against the, the Europeans, uh, a guerrilla war, because they didn't have modern-day weaponry, right? You have to consider what the Spanish brought with themselves. They have metal metal uh, uniforms, right? They had headgear. They had swords. They had lances. They got war horses and attack dogs. Uh, they had shields made out of steel, too. So when those people do battle against uh, another people, the native people who had only uh, arrows and maybe uh, some sticks, uh, they, it's going to be an uneven sure, uh, sure. encounter. And so the Europeans won. So what the Indians did, they went into the bush, into the mountains of Puerto Rico, and engaged in a protracted guerrilla warfare, meaning that they lasted for over 20 years. Uh, and the Spanish were not able to subdue them for 20 years until diseases hit the colony, Puerto Rico, and then people started dying off from diseases. Oh, and what what's that war called? Is there a name to the war? Um, they call it the War of the Caciques or the War of the Indian Chiefs. Because what happened in Puerto Rico is that the Indians realized that we're not going to be able to win if we attack as tribes, right? If you had like 15 tribes throughout Puerto Rico and one tribe attacks and they defeat you, well, they got you, right? So what the chief did, they created a uh, an alliance, an island-wide alliance. And so all of them met in a group. They did a test to see that the Spaniards were mortals. They drowned one of them and waited till the person died. They decided that they could not be uh, uh, gods because gods don't die. And oh, if who, they, where the god part come in? Somebody, well, the they, Spanish... The Spanish um, in, in the view of the native people of the America, the Spanish, because they look the way they look with the beard, light skin, they have weapons mm -hmm. that spit fire, uh, like cannons and guns, and they have horses that they had never seen. They assume that these people had to be uh, uh, godlike. And the Spanish played on that in order to convince the Indians that you don't want to attack me, I have superpowers. And so the Indians had to defeat that logic. And the way they defeated it was by promising a Spaniard that if you need to cross that river over there, we'll cross you. No problem. We'll lift you up on our shoulders, right? And we'll get you across. That way you don't have to get wet. And when they got him into the middle of the lake, they drowned him. They determined that he was not a god because he died. And they decided that since they're not gods, we're going to attack them and we're going to push them out of the island. What was there? Uh, uh, was it brutal? Uh, it, it was it brutal in the America Spanish, when that was going Calvary, on. They used Calvary units. Uh, they did hangings. They burned people alive. Wow. They did mutilations. Um, but the same thing will happen later on when the when the Africans were brought over. The interesting thing is that many Africans got got the um, a sense that if you get away from the plantations and you run to the bush, maybe you run into the Indians. Yeah. And so they also did the same thing as the Indians. They mounted guerrilla attacks from, from the mountains on in, onto the um, Spanish settlements 
and try to create a lot of trouble for the Spaniards to keep themselves from being recaptured and re-enslaved. That's like a hidden history of Latin America that a lot of people don't know about. A lot of this unity that happened on the countryside, in the mountains, in the swamps, and in the forest, where Africans and the few Indians that were left around decided to work together to try to defeat the Spaniards. And when they couldn't defeat them, they decided to create alternative societies away from the Spaniards. If you go to Jamaica, they call this society Maroons. Yeah, yeah, okay. And that's exactly what happened in Puerto Rico and Cuba. A lot of Maroon communities out there in the in the deep interior of the island. Remember that Puerto Rico and Cuba is very forested. I mean, you, you couldn't get from one town to the other uh, easily because you had to go through all these mountains and rivers and it's muddy, uh, it's dangerous, right? There's a lot of uh, uh, snakes, uh, a lot of uh, critters and stuff like that. Plus the, the um, logistics of crossing on foot. You know, people didn't have the advantages of vehicles, right? Uh, and you couldn't use a boat. So you just had to walk. And, and so those areas the Spanish stayed away from because those were areas where a lot of them got ambushed. Okay. <laughs> it, this is the way that people defeated a more uh, uh, well-funded um, um, and, and well-equipped enemy. You, you couldn't defeat them in, in an in a equal war on the fields. Yeah, I got you. Right, because they would lose. They tested that. They knew it didn't, it didn't work. The only way that you do is you lure them into the bush where you had the advantage because the Indians and the Africans had lived in forested areas before the Europeans came. So they knew how to handle that. That's the, the creation of the modern day guerrilla movements. Right. That were later used throughout the world. Uh, how do you know this? Did they teach this in grade school? You know, in Puerto Rico, it was not taught as much, and there's a reason for that. When the United States took over Puerto Rico, much in the same way that when the Spaniards took over Puerto Rico, the first goal of a colonizer is to deny the colonized his or her own knowledge. So you want to keep the people dumb, right? So they kept people away from knowledge that would validate their culture, that would validate their language, that would tell them you belong to this culture and you should be proud of it. They took that away. And they replaced that with literature that reminded them that you are now Hispanics. And as a result of that, people, unfortunately, they bought into that mentality and some people didn't, right? The ones who didn't are the ones like me who are still around and, and are saying, we need to rescue our past. Uh, and then uh, when the United States came in, they did the same thing. Uh, the U.S. banished Spanish from the uh, local schools. Uh, they changed the name of Puerto Rico to Puerto Rico with an O. Uh, they disbanded the local government and they changed the economy to fit their economic plans uh, and, leave, and left the people essentially to fend for themselves. And, and this is why there are Puerto Ricans in the US because many of them could not survive that environment. They, they couldn't have enough money to raise their family. They were not given opportunity to get schooling. And so they came to the United States looking for an opportunity like that. Of course, they didn't find it right away. It will take the 1960s, right? The ethnic renaissance and the social activism of the 1960s to start that process of people regaining their their uh, culture. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, the, the young lords, for example, were part of that. Okay, I want to go back, but then I, I don't, let's not forget that thought. When, is there somebody who you all revere as a, a, a warrior uh, who helped fight against the Spaniards? There were multiples. Uh, there were multiples. The first one in Puerto Rican history is Agüevana. Agüevana was the cacique or the chief of the Taino people of Puerto Rico who called that meeting that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. He got everybody together and decided, okay, this is the strategy. This is what we need to do 
to eliminate this enemy that continues to pour in and take control of our land. So there are statues in Puerto Rico for him. The guy who led the campaign to drown the Spaniard, there's a, a statue for him. Uh, Guarionex was his name. Uh, are you familiar with Arthur Schomburg? Yeah. He was a very important um, person in the U.S. Um, in the early uh, 1900s. He was right out there with Booker T. Washington, oh, okay. uh, Woodrow Carter, and W.E.B. Du Bois. He's so in the he's same American? pictures with them. Du Bois. Yeah, no, but I, the guy you're talking about, is he American? Yeah, yeah. and they knew him as Arthur Schomburg. He had like a, French, a German name. But his actual name is Arturo Alfonso Schoenberg, a Puerto Rican. He came to the United States um, to fight for the independence of Cuba from the U.S. by being a, uh, a publicist. And then when the war was lost and Cuba did not gain its independence, he decided to focus his energy on collecting data on the Black experience in the U.S. So he... Uh, use a telegraph. He used to work at a telegraph company and he sent messages throughout the world telling people, if you have anything about blacks, I'll trade it for you. What you want me to send you, you send me what you have on them. Anything, books, articles, stories, legends, music, religious artifacts, anything that where black people contributed in some kind of way. And then he got so much material that in 1935 or 1936, the New York Public Library bought it from him and created the Schomburg Center for Research on Black Culture. Yeah. And, right. and it's located at 125th yeah. in, the, in the corner of Malcolm X Boulevard. Right, right. In Harlem. That yeah. was him. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay, okay. I got you. He was a Puerto I, Rican I, that was very active oh, really? in the struggle for uh, Black rights. And he's considered one of the fathers of black studies in the U.S. Yeah. He wrote uh, a, a very uh, important article. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he wrote a very important article titled, The Negro Needs to Know His Past. Or something to that effect. Uh -huh. All right. And that saying, became, yeah. that became like a, 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 rallying, a rallying point for a lot of people to get excited about studying, you know, black history. Yeah. All right, I want to stay back on the on the on, on the uh, on the fight during the time that the Spaniards were there and colonizing. Um, what did they allow them to have holidays or any? Uh, no, because part of the colonial process is to deny people their culture, right? So they they didn't mention a way or not. They didn't mention the Indians as much. And when it was mentioned, it was to say that the Spaniards came to the area, Christianized the Indians and helped them develop the island better. <laughs> so you got this sanitized uh, version of history in which the Spaniards come across as the civilization of saviors of Puerto Rico who came to do good things for the Indians. When in fact, the storyline is that they decimated the Indians in a quest to get rich out of the resources of the island. Initially, that those resources were gold, but later it was agricultural products that would be produced by Indians and later by Africans. Okay, uh, a couple more on that. Uh, as they did in America, there were, let's say, Gullah Geechee people who kept that culture alive. I, in, I, 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 were the y'all able to keep the culture and do they have a title of those people who did and did not necessarily lose? No, there are a lot of people who um, kept their culture um, by getting an education. That was part of it. Now, there are people in the island, as there are in many other places, that are self-taught, right? They call them autodidactic, right? They they teach themselves. They they pass the oral tradition from person to person, from family to family. And in that way, they kept the story alive of who they are, where they came from. There's a lot of that in Puerto Rico still. A lot of many, you know, a lot of people that are, that have Indian heritage or Black heritage uh, who conduct ceremonies, musical festivals, who do poetry, 
uh, to try to keep the story of their ancestors alive and well. Uh, but of course, the Spanish did not promote that, right? Yeah, because sure. they were interested only in denying the people their own culture because people who don't know their culture are much easier to dominate yeah, sure. than people who understand where they come from. Yeah. All right. I'll stay in on that just a tad. What is some of that culture that they were that they had, uh, like in the foods, in the clothing, yeah. that kind of thing? Well, there's a lot of African food. People say that Puerto Ricans eat like Africans. <laughs> and the reason they say that is that we have a lot of food, which is the food that many Af enslaved Africans ate. Codfish, uh, black eyed peas, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, tubers like manioc or what we call yuca. Um, there's a lot of uh, food that is prepared in unique African ways in Puerto Rico, like pasteles, which is grounded, you know, uh, tubers like um, like pumpkin and yuca, potatoes. They grind this stuff together. They wrap it with a leaf of a plantain tree and they boil it. And that food in Puerto Rico, you go anywhere, people would kill for that, you know. <laughs> That's, oh, okay. It's considered to be the the native or the typical Puerto Rican dish. So there's still a lot of stuff like that on the island that people do. Uh, the music, particularly, is a lot. Salsa is African music in its in in its core rhythms. Uh, is music, uh, for example, the cowbell. We call that the heart of the music. I have a cowbell here. I'll show you. Yeah, please. Oh, I, I keep up with the music. This is a uh, cowbell. Mm -hmm. So I have instruments in here all over the place. Um, I enjoy it. I don't know how to play them, but I enjoy the music and I, I pass it along to people. I used to do a radio show. So I was a DJ for a while. And then I, in my Facebook page, I, I download a lot of uh, videos on the history of salsa. Okay. What what about the clothing? Was it was it uh like yeah, what 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 did the clothing look like from the original people, let's call it? The culture? Yes. Of, of the Indian people? Yes. Is there a uh, they, type of they dress? Basically, yeah, they basically uh did not have much in terms of uh clothing like uh Europeans will have. They were essentially halfway naked. Um they dye their bodies with a red dye. Really? And for that reason, they look red, and which is where people still continue to this day to call Indians the red people, because the dye protects you against insects oh. and against the, the burning sun. It's like, uh, you know, what would you might call sun tanning lotion. You know, the Indians use that to cover themselves. They smoke for ritual purposes where they met in a circle to discuss uh, events that they wanted to memorialize. They wanted to pass it along. They wanted to remember them. Uh, so they will have a pipe of tobacco and they will pass it along. Uh, so tobacco is, is a native Caribbean product that the Indians use. The word canoe, right? Canoe uh, is a boat or a watercraft. That was the system that they used to get around the island in, on the rivers and to hop from island to island. Um, the Indian uh, pioneer the use of medicines. Uh, they knew how to harvest a lot of different plants and they and to use the ingredients in different ways um, to essentially to hunt and to fish. Um, they did not do a lot of building like the Aztecs or the Incas. Those were really large, advanced civilizations. So the Indians in Puerto Rico were at a pre-Inca or pre-Maya stage. They were not yet at that level, but they had a social structure. Uh, it was made up of a, a shaman or a priest. They had a warrior class, they had a peasant class, and they had a nobility. Uh, they live in huts that were uh, comfortable for the weather in the Caribbean, so it doesn't get hot. Um, the women can uh, and often uh, became chiefs 
which means that women were not oppressed mm. as in European culture. Okay. Um, women chiefs were common in Puerto Rico. We know at least two or three women that were considered chiefs. In other words, they had a whole tribe under their control. Um, and then the music that they left behind was integrated into the modern day salsa music. For example, the scratcher mm -hmm. or the maracas. Mm -hmm. Those are Taino uh, instruments, okay? Africans had a version of that, but the Indians had those already here. So musically, um, culturally, politically, there are many elements of Indian culture that are still around, although people may or may not recognize that origin because it's been so long, 500 years. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned Cuba. Uh, what's the connection between Cuba and Puerto Rico? Is there one? Puerto something? Rico is part of the Caribbean. So uh, the Caribbean is a string of islands. And they start with Trinidad, which is where uh, Stokely Carmichael was born, right? The guy who, who framed the term Black is Beautiful. Right. He was born in Trinidad, in one of the islands in the Caribbean. Right. Marcos Garvey was born in Jamaica. Right. Which is south of, of Cuba. I named my son Marcus, my first son, Marcus, after him. And um, there are islands in between, Martinique, Guadalupe. Um, all the way to the Virgin Islands, uh, the Bahamas. And then Cuba is the largest island in the Caribbean. And that's where the revolution of 1959 happened. And those are the same, that's the same island where salsa, the original element, the baseline of salsa music was first practiced. The yeah. mambo sound, right? The cha-cha-cha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, later, all of that would be converted into boogaloo, Latin jazz in the U.S., but all that started in Cuba. We just hosted uh, the son of Machito. Machito was one of the pioneers in Afro-Cuban music. His band in 1937 was called the Afro-Cuban Boys. Okay. In, uh, in uh, Very Cuba, interesting. The Cuba... Uh... Uh, to, to talk about them just a tad. They, are they communists? Well, you know, what happened with Cuba was, just like Puerto Rico, right? We we share the same flag. The, oh, the colors are, are inverse, but it's the same flag. Uh, so Puerto Ricans and, and Cubans have a lot in common that way. Um, they too, you know, were colonized. They had Indians, the same Taino people that colonized, that were living in Puerto Rico, were also living in Cuba. The Spanish did the same thing in Cuba that they did in Puerto Rico. The only major difference in Cuba is that being a larger island with more land, fertile land that you can grow things on, the Spanish brought in a lot more Africans there than they did in Puerto Rico. Something like 1.2 million people at some point altogether, maybe more. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, Cuba quickly became much more black. Uh, particularly in the western part of the island uh, and in the eastern part of the island, um, not so much in the middle. So black culture has always been a very in integral part of Cuban culture ever since the days of slavery. And so they had a revolution back in 1959 uh, against a government that was supported by the United States that they believe was not in the best interest of the Cuban government. It was corrupt. They were making money by inviting the mafia to have all kinds of hotels and casinos in Cuba. They were losing money in agriculture because the United States owned the railroads and many of the farms, and they were essentially siphoning off the wealth of Cuba to the United States. So they got rid of that, um, that president or that, yeah, that president. Uh, Fidel Castro did, and he started the Cuban Revolution since that time. Oh. So since 1959, Cuba has been a socialist country. Oh, so that's where Castro comes in. Well, uh, Castro is very smart. I mean, he did a lot of interesting things. I want to share one with you that you yeah, might find please. particularly interesting in this context of this conversation. In the 1970s, Angola and Mozambique underwent their own revolutionary movement. 
they were controlled by the Portuguese in Africa. So the Angolan and government requested international help because while they are fighting for the independence of Angola, the South African government, the apartheid government, right? It's, it's a white government was sending troops to Angola to defeat them, to, to cause them not to get rid of the Portuguese. So they put in a request for solidarity and the Cubans said, okay, we'll help you. They sent battalions of black Cubans to, to Angola. The, the US government complained to Cuba, the United Nations and say, why are you sending all these black Cubans to Angola? Aren't you starting a new colony there? I said, no, we're not. Uh, see, in slavery days, Angola was one of the countries that a lot of the enslaved Africans in Cuba came from. We're just trying to give back to, to them. I got for you. What was done, so for what was done to them during slavery. I got you. And so as a result of the help from Cuba, Angola became free. Oh. And so that's the, why the America Cubans hates were able Cuba to, so much. The Cubans were able to push the South Africans out and uh, assure the victory of, of the Angolans against the Portuguese. Hmm. Uh, the well, United, well, United States did not like that, unfortunately. Okay, so what you've said now is when we talk about the Europeans and their colonization, uh, uh, one of the instances that America was like Europeans was down in Cuba and in, in Puerto Rico. They the same thing. They It's the same white dominated social structure. Oh, really? I never thought of that. Oh, really? Yeah, but with the only distinction that since the Spaniards in 1492 had just broken off from 800 century of Muslim rule, right? They still had elements of Islam in their culture. And so even though they pretended to be whites or Europeans in that context, Many people knew that they were mixed. Oh, really? It, uh, you know, the, the Spanish look more like Italian. They got black hair and the beard yeah, and all of that. Yeah. And some of them uh, retain Islamic names uh, or had names that resemble Islamic names. For example, when the Spanish colonized California, they could have chosen another name, but they used the word Caliph, which is the Arabic word for a community. Oh. California. Yeah, I got you. Calif. And, yeah. and a lot of the words in Spanish, like azúcar, sugar, is an Arabic word. Alhambra, which is uh, another Spanish word that comes from the Arabic. So we have a lot of words in Spanish that are Arabic, that are um, because the Spanish were under Muslim rule for 800, 800 years. Okay. Uh, it's kind of like uh, something that people don't want to talk about too much yeah. in Spain. Right. But they were part of the Roman Empire too. So uh, two or three of the Roman emperors that you see on the movies, right, were yeah. born in Spain. They were Spaniards. Uh -huh. So people don't know that part. The Spain, Spain was part of the Roman Empire and part of the world of Islam at different points. Yeah. Wow. Um. When we talk about uh, Puerto Rico and, and America coming there, uh, how, how did America get there? Do you know that? Yeah, how, how did that they, they, in In the, um, right around the 1820s, during the time of Andrew Jackson, the United States made a bid to the French to buy the Louisiana Purchase, right? Once they got that, people got excited about extending the border of the United States westward. They wanted to go past the Mississippi River. The only thing that stood them in the way was the Indians. They called that Indian country. And then south of that Indian country is Mexico because the country of Mexico extended all the way up to California. Montana, Nevada, all of that was Spanish territory and Mexico inherited it. So when they became a nation, a republic, part of Mexico was that big section of the United States that we now call the U.S. Southwest. Once the United States took over um, the Louisiana Purchase, they waged a war against Mexico and took half its territory away. National territory of Mexico was cut in half. One half the United States took by force, 
the other half is from Texas downward. You know, okay. Texas is the Texas used to be a part of Mexico, but from from Texas north and west, that became American territory. Right. And then from Texas down, that was what the Mexico that we know today. In the 1840s and 50s, the United States consolidated power across the continent, right? Now they got from the Pacific to the Atlantic, right? From New York to California. Right. And they, they had it all the way down to Texas. So it needed a lot of natural resources that they didn't have. Some of those natural resources were located in Central America and the Caribbean. So the United States gradually began to expand its political power and economic power over the Caribbean area. And as a result of that, they waged war on Spain, as a result of which they took Puerto Rico and Cuba from Spain. Oh. Is that what's that war called? Uh, the Spanish, well, in the U.S. it's called the Spanish-American War. Right. In Latin right. America, it's called the Spanish-Cuba-American War. Okay. Because Cuba, uh, Cuba had a big role in that in that in that fight. The the Cubans um, fought the Americans. They had a huge military already because they had been fighting the Spaniards for some time. When the U.S. walked in there and they saw that the Cubans were well armed they made a, a calculated decision that it's not worth it for us to uh, invest more mar Marines in keeping Cuba. It, it's too dangerous for us. Okay. But so we, we yeah. enter into a treaty with Cuba called the Platt Amendment, essentially a deal whereby we will rule, rule Cuba indirectly, not by having troops on the soil, but by exercising control through diplomatic channels. So they injected a constitutional amendment on the Cuban constitution that provided for the United States to intervene and control Cuba and by having a base in Cuba, the Guantanamo base that they now have. Mm -hmm. And then that's because of the Cuban military. You know, they, they were just afraid that it would not work to try to subdue the Cubans. Puerto Rico was not in the same circumstance. It was a lot smaller and Puerto Rico did not have a standing army ready to fight the U.S. Unfortunately for Puerto Ricans, the United States simply swallowed them. Uh, in, in essence, they took over with very little resistance. They, even though they did fight, they couldn't prevail against a, a country like the United States with one of the largest militaries yeah. at that time, even. What, 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 what did Cuba have that we wanted, though? You said the resources. Uh, Cuba had several things. Uh, one of the things that was selling like hot potatoes <laughs> okay. in, in, the, uh, in the latter part of the 18th century and which uh, a growing nation needed was sugar. The United States only grew sugar in Louisiana because of the tropical environment and a little bit in Florida. Cuba, on the other hand, cornered the market on sugar. They were the leading country on the planet that produced sugar in, in the in the 19th century. And so uh, the United States invested in the Cuban economy throughout the 19th century by sending business people down there. So when the moment came to battle the Spaniards, they were already situated to play a bigger role in the economic development of Cuba or what we might call economic exploitation of Cuba. Uh, the United States invested in railroads, invested in hospitals. They invested in many key areas of the Cuban economy. But, but what they really wanted was sugar. Um, because think about it this way. You, you have an industrial society, right? So that means industrialization means that the people who live in the farms no longer live in the farm. They come to factories to work from eight to five. Right. People get tired of that. So they need sugar, coffee, candy, cake, anything to keep the energy up. And so sugar was a, a major, major uh, staple at that time. The U.S. wanted to corner the market on sugar. In taking over Cuba, guaranteed that market. And then Cuba also had coffee and tobacco. 
uh, Puerto Rico also had sugar and coffee and tobacco, but less of it by comparison to Cuba. So Cuba was the big prize for the U.S. Puerto Rico was secondary to Cuba in terms of what they wanted. When we, when we talk about American influence on Cuba, so when you grew up, you knew, did, did they teach you American history or? Yes, uh, unfortunately, okay. uh, and I say that not in, in disrespect to American history because you learn it from everything that is history, you learn something, right? Good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to learn about history from, you know, being a child, but um, the history in Puerto Rico was basically, um, the history of the United States. And I didn't quite understand why that was significant to us in Puerto Rico. I actually questioned that even as a child. I didn't understand why we were learning about Abraham Lincoln because they didn't call him Abraham. In Spanish it was Abraham Lincoln. And then the implication by teaching about Abraham Lincoln or Abraham Lincoln was that he freed the slaves in Puerto Rico. So I, I thought that that happened. When I learned about Jorge Washington, they don't say George, right? They call it in Spanish, Jorge. I thought that Jorge Washington was a Puerto Rican because I'm Jorge. Right. And then I learned that he was not. I said, wait, wait a minute. Why are we learning about all these people? I, we learn about Benjamin Franklin, not Benjamin, Benjamin. So I said to myself, so Benjamin must have done something good for us. Right. And so I learned that he was flying a kite and he hit lightning right. and discovered electricity. I figured that Puerto Ricans have electricity because of Benjamin Franklin. I thought that he was on the island <laughs> until I came to the United States and I realized that it was all part of the colonial model to teach history of the colonizer, not the history of the colonized. Now, now, when you okay, how about this one? So, in 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 Puerto Rico, you you were considered American. In Puerto Rico, uh, up to a point, because uh, I was born in 1954. By that time, all Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens. But at the time of my grandfather who was born in 1899, Puerto Ricans were still subjects of Spain. When the U.S. took over the island, they retained their Spanish identity, although they didn't have citizenship of Spain because the U.S. is not in control of the island. So we were in limbo as far as what citizenship we had until 1917. At that point, the United States Senate or Congress decided to pass the Jones Act, the Jones Act. And the Jones Act made Puerto Rican U.S. citizens by congressional act. Okay. In other words, it was not like Puerto Ricans said, hey, uh, excuse us, uh, we would like to be citizens. Can you do something right. about it? Oh, sure. Right. We're right. going to do it. Right. It was So people would argue back then that it was an imposed citizenship. Uh, that, uh, uh, that we uh, were uh, like giving it a citizenship that we didn't want or that okay. we didn't request. Uh, okay, a couple more. Uh, so does that make you a proud American or what are you I first? Was, a proud Puerto no, I was too young. Or what? At the time in, when I left Puerto Rico, I was 13. I had no social consciousness of the issues that I would learn later on when I came to the U.S. When I came to the U.S. in 1967, I participated in the civil rights movement. From from uh, uh, um, um, middle school. And Hold on, let me stop you right school. there. When you came, you mean your family moved here? Yes, yeah, well, we left Puerto Rico in 1967 because at the time Puerto Ricans could not live on the island. They were not making a lot of money. Okay. We were on welfare on the island. My father had left to the United States. He didn't come back. Uh, so my mother was raising us by herself. We lived in a female headed household. Okay. And there were five of us, five children. Oh, man. We were living in a wooden shack with a tin roof in a litter, um, essentially what you might call over here the hood in Puerto Rico is what we call more or less the same thing on the island. Right. A, a, a row of houses of where poor people live that have, you know, rudimentary plumbing, right. you know, right. like a little tube on the floor that carries water. Oh. Um, no heating, nothing like that, obviously. Um, 
And my mother worked in a factory making $28 a week. Oh. It was it was starvation wages. And so she moved to the United States because a friend of her told her that we could potentially do better here. So I came to the U.S. at the age of 13 in 1967. By 1965, I was already connected to the civil rights movement because we had the young lords in our neighborhood. Two where, blocks your from neighborhood my house. where? In New York? They, in Harlem. I grew oh. up in Harlem. Oh, oh, okay. I got you. I got you. I got you. I grew up in Harlem. Spanish right. Harlem, we call it, because yeah, right. once the Puerto Ricans settled down, yeah. they they segmented the neighborhood. So one yeah. part became Spanish Harlem and the other one Harlem. Yeah. Uh couple more. Uh uh, do you still go back to Puerto Rico? Is that your homeland? I do, I do. do yeah. <laughs> I do. I haven't broken away from it, but partly because I do a lot of research. And so I gotta I go there to the archives, I go there to present, to study, and not so much to enjoy myself. I don't have mm -hmm. too much time for that. Mm -hmm. But I do go to the island to present, to speak, or to do research, that sort of stuff. And um I got relatives on the island, not really close ones, but people who have my last name particularly. Okay. I go visit them and uh, they recognize me as a relative, even though we're not connected. Like they're not really family, but the last, it's like if you have a name like Quinta Kunte, okay? Yeah. And you go to a community, the guy is Quinta Kunte, you, you be sure that he'll say you're my family. Yeah, right, right. Sure, sure. In Puerto Rico, the Chinese is only one name in that whole island with the same name. Yeah, sure. And so if you had the same name, we recognize you as a family. Just yeah. knock on the door, they know they know instinctively. Yeah. Okay. It's a relative, whoever right, he right, is right. visiting us. Right. So I do that a lot. I go knock on people's doors. Oh, say hello. Man. Um um how, how did you get to be so smart? Uh and you didn't well, get it caught wasn't up always... in the problems of Spanish Harlem and, and the I've been you... studying this field of Latin American history for close to 40 years now. I went to school in the United States at the age of 13, and they put me down two grades below the grade that I was in in Puerto Rico. Really? They called that great retention, uh, which essentially means that you don't get to start with your age group you get to get put in what they call the dumb classes. The people who don't speak English were ridiculed because supposedly we were not smart because we didn't have the grasp of the language. Uh, they call that bilingual education in some corners, but that was later on when they refined it. When I came, that was not in place yet. So um, I didn't like school because people mocked me because I couldn't say things in English correctly. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the language in Puerto Rico, and I only learned that a little bit in the U.S. So I quit school, went to work at a factory, and then from one factory, I jumped over to another one, to a restaurant, I cleaned houses, I cleaned buildings. I used to do errands at the Empire State Building. <laughs> and uh, eventually, I returned back to school with a GED, high school equivalency diploma. Yeah. Got back to school, but before that, unfortunately, and I say that for the audience more than for me, because I, I felt that I grew with it. I was in gangs. I was wow. in three three different gangs. Yeah. Well, it, it, life in the hood, it was like that, you know, in, yeah. in the 1960s, there were gangs all over New York City, the black space, the, you know, the savage calls. Oh. Um I was part of a group called the Renegades of Harlem. Oh. And so uh, I used what I learned in the hood about surviving to survive in college. And and I um, went to college with a high school equivalency diploma. I got my bachelor's degree in 1979. I got my master's in 1983. I got my doctorate in 1994. Wow. But each way, each step along the way was a struggle against the language, against the culture, against a system that was not designed to get Latinos, you know, to get educated. So I fought those waves of those, you know, um, walls 
that existed uh, back then. Uh, and but I I I I climbed my way up. And oh, I um, love it. Yeah. So so I I went there. I have uh, an adjunct faculty appointment in the African American Studies Department. I'm a full professor in the Department of History, and I'm the director of the Latino Studies program. So I wear three three hats. Yeah, I love it. Did you, has your mom? Did your mom live to see this? Is she still alive? My mother died about three years ago. Oh, so she saw this. Yeah, she was um uh, ninety three though. She yeah, was, she lived a full life. Um, you say Latino. Latino means what? Well, the Latino is like uh, African American for blacks, right? Oh, okay. Back in the days when blacks were so called Negroes, before that they were people of color or colors, right? Like the National Association for Color People. Right. So they had this nomenclature that they used to to keep blacks away from Africa, right? They never used the word Afro. And so in the 1960s, Blacks began to realize, hey, wait a minute, we're not just color Black or Negro, we are descendants of Africans. Right. We got something to be proud of. And we need to go back and recapture that African heritage. Right. And so Puerto Ricans and Mexican-Americans back in the 60s, Mexican-Americans were called Mexican-Americans, right? They were hyphenated Americans. But the young people in the hood recognized that they had Indian heritage. And they recognized that they were born in the United States and they had Indian heritage and Mexican heritage. So they called themselves Chicanos. Okay, I've heard that term, yes. Right, and, and so what happened in Puerto Ricans is the Puerto Ricans began to realize that Puerto Rican, or the word Puerto Rican was a Spanish word used by the Spaniards to name the island where they were born. But the Indians, remember the Aguaybana that I mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm, right. He called the island Borinquen. Borinquen. <clears throat> and the people from Borinquen are Boricuas. So Puerto Ricans in the diaspora, we call ourselves Boricuas, descendants of the island of Borinquen, oh. even though we're still Puerto Rican. Oh, and okay. so some of us who don't have an affiliation with Puerto Rico or with Mexico, who come from Latin America, they needed an identity. The US government had always used Hispanic as a global term. So people that were being born in the United States from Colombia, you know, Peru, Venezuela, other places, they thought that it was better for them to have an identity that reflects Latin America. So they called themselves Latinos. Okay, one, one, one more today, question. Latin, Latin, Latin America is what? Uh, all of the countries that were colonized by Spain. Which are? Which are Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, okay. and all of South America with the exception of Brazil. Okay, okay. So, okay. so they wanted an identity that will remind them where they came from or the answer. I got you. I got you. But that would be different from Hispanic. You know why Hispanic? Because Hispanic remind them, reminded them that they were descendants of Spaniards and they didn't want to have that identity. They wanted I got to you. Latinos. Oh, so some people will not say Hispanic. They, they, they don't. No, speak. no, they'll, they'll, they'll get mad at you. Yo, I see. I see. I always oh. tell people, you know, when I talk to them and I'd say, you know, what is your preferred identity? Because of that, because some people don't want to be called Hispanic. In fact, they may even say I'm not Chicano, right? They may say I'm Mexican. Uh, so we have to be mindful, right? Of yeah, that you. some people have preferences. Yeah, I ask. Yeah. I always yeah. ask, yeah. You know, what do you consider yourself? And there are people nowadays that call themselves Latinx. I hadn't heard that one. Well, the, the X is like Malcolm X, right? Right, right, right. right. Yeah, Malcolm yeah. was saying I'm Malcolm X because I don't know the X. Right. Like right. in a formula, you have to right. figure out the, the formula right. to identify right. what X means. Yeah, she sure. says, I don't know in Africa where I came from because the sure. Europeans killed the heritage. I'm just going to call myself Malcolm X. Yeah, and sure. so many Latinos using the same logic call themselves Latinx oh. because they don't know what part of Latin America their family comes from. I see, I got you. Or they may not, not that yeah. they don't know. They yeah, yeah. Hey, have you written a book or anything like that? 
I written about three. Uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah. This we this plug is, on this, this show too. This is one of my last ones. Yeah, it's called uh, "Slaves, uh, Canvas, and Exiles in Puerto Rico." Oh, and then um, I have um, another book on race, uh, race and labor in the Hispanic Caribbean. Okay. That deals with West Indians like Stokely Carmichael. Yes. Who migrated to Puerto Rico and lived on that island. Okay. And so I chronicle the people from, you know, the islands who moved to Puerto look to Puerto Rico looking for opportunities. One more. When is the when is a good time? What's a holiday to go to Puerto Rico? Is there yeah, like an independence <laughs> day, something like that that people should to go? The most important holidays in Puerto Rico, um are uh, the um, what they call the Day of La Raza, the Day of the People, which is equivalent to Columbus Day in the United States. Oh, uh, really? People celebrate that day not so much for Columbus, but because of the birth of a, of a culture at that time that, that, that was essentially restructured or reformulated as Puerto Rican culture later on. Oh. But the best time to go to Puerto Rico is uh, during the winter months here, which is warm over there. Yeah. And uh, the worst time to go to Puerto Rico is when the school session is over for high schools and colleges, which is the summer here, because during that time, everybody's at the beaches. Okay. And then okay. you'll be like in the middle of other people. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, uh, do, do you have a website? For Puerto Rico? Do you have one that people can follow oh, you? How do people no, follow you? No, I have a Facebook page. Okay, okay. And I and I download my music there. Okay. I put a lot of music in there just to have fun with people, you know? Okay, okay. Well, and, well, we're um, going gonna to put all that in the description. Um, you have some uh, really good questions, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah you, you. you hit all the right chords. <laughs> You hit all the right chords. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, I, I appreciate you coming on Strong Inspirations. You you really enlightened me, and I'm sure the viewers are a whole lot. Uh, I thank you for that. Now, I got. I still got to ask you this: Is there one question that I have not asked? Okay. I think maybe the maybe the the good question is, you know, what would this um, future look like? Uh, okay. You know, okay. for the Latino population, I don't have the answer to that, but I. I always tell people that part of the answer has to be education, as okay. it would be for African Americans. Yeah, sure. And for that reason, I push education a lot, whatever I can. Yeah, sure. I love it. Well, hey, everybody, I told you you're going to like this. This is Strong Inspirations. <laughs> he, he, he knocked it out the box <laughs> without a doubt. Uh, and, thank you for inviting uh, me, and I want to yeah. thank the audience for listening too. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I, I I got another question. There are a lot of uh, Latin players in the baseball league. Yes. What's the story to that? Well, you know, uh, baseball uh, and soccer are, yeah, are right. really big in Puerto Rico. Uh, soccer was played by the indigenous people before okay. it became a sport. Okay. In, in on the planet. Okay. But baseball was big, uh, has always been big. Okay. And uh, Roberto Clemente, right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's one of the big names in, 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 in baseball, but there's yeah. so many, yeah, so many so people. Many. Yeah. You know what it is, is when you come from an island where educational opportunity were not available to yeah. a lot of people, yeah. uh, the sports became an avenue for yeah. social mobility. Sure, sure. You know, just like sure. it is in basketball and football here, you know? Sure, yeah. Uh, and so many Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Cubans, not so much Cubans now because Cuba had been caught off by the uh, embargo that the U.S. put into place. Sure. Uh, not maintaining contact with the island. But before that embargo, guess guess how the major leagues functioned back in the 1880s? Yeah, they, they recruited had... Cuban workers. I yeah, mean, right, Cuban right. players. Right, that's right. Sure did. They they recruited yeah. Cuban players and, sure. and, 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 and the racist people who say, wait a minute, they're black. And say, no, 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 no. This is Spanish Cubans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I <laughs> But of course, you. everybody knew that they were phenotypically yeah. black, yeah. right? Yeah, right, right, right. But, right. but it was a way to defeat Jim Crowism. Right, right. 
Everybody, I told you you're going to like this, so come on, hit the subscribe <laughs> button on Strong Inspirations, where we give it to you straight, no chase, and hit the like button on this video, because uh, uh, there is no love button. Uh, tell somebody about Strong Inspirations, and to you, my brother, I say this, and I mean this with all sincerity, I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you become, because you got that background that you... There was something inside of you. Somebody said something to you along the way. Somebody well, I, said I, I something was, to you. I, I was lucky that when I uh, I was in Harlem, there was a local Irish priest who said, let me help you out. There you go. There was a social worker who said, I can extend a hand. You, you can get out of these gangs. Yeah. And then I finally went to a folk healer who was a uh, a practitioner of Santeria, or Afro-derived uh, religion from yeah. Cuba. Yeah. And uh, she did a ceremony for me and uh, baptized me with an African name and, uh, and told me, don't look back, just look oh, towards the future. There it is. That's the story there of yeah. how I got back to, into education. You just got it out of me. Yeah. I didn't think you would have noticed, but you did. That's yeah, really no, it's no question. There it is. Uh, and thank you so much for coming on. My Everybody, pleasure. you know what we're doing. Uh, yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.